Thanks for joining us tonight. It's fantastic to see so many community organisers from all around the nation. So we deliberately use the word lies in the title of tonight's session because it's beginning to feel like disinformation has almost become an accepted component of digital communications and certainly seems to be an accepted tactic of right-wing campaigning. When did lies and propaganda become disinformation and what's the difference? Richard, would you like to start? Oh, well, lies lies and disinformation have a long and not very proud history in, oh dear, Oh, yeah, it's working. Uh, yeah. A long and proud uh, history in in democracies and and in civilizations around the world. So lying is not new, and disinformation is not new. What's new is how uh, social media amplifies that and allows kind of peer to peer lying in a way that's really quite new. So we've always been able to lie to our friends and neighbours, but it didn't travel very far. And traditional, you know, mainstream media, broadsheet media, call it what you want, well, it used to be bound by all sorts of rules and conventions that made sort of the overt lying hard. But social media has changed all of that uh, and it's now very easy to, to, to spread lies and disinformation. The difference between the two, well, lies are just, you know, made up things. Disinformation is often more subtle. Uh, during the voice campaign, for example, uh, there was uh, a clip of uh, of the prime minister seeming to, you know, really dump on on the voice. When actually the longer clip was someone had put a question to him, he restated the arguments made by the critics and then debunked the arguments. But the way it was edited, it just sounded like the prime minister was spelling out all the problems you could possibly think of. Was that a lie? Well, no, but was it misleading? You bet. It was absolutely disinformation. Absolutely, absolutely. And I was going to ask the two of you just to kick us off, uh, both of you, to give me your sort of t- quick fire, just top two examples of your, um, your favourite lies from a favourite being a, you know, not quite the right term, but top two lies of the nemesis era. There were so many that we had to restrict it to the top two for the last sort of 15, 10, 15 years in, uh, in politics. Oh, I'll go first. Um, uh, that you know, we need to cut taxes for high income earners to keep the economy strong. Uh, that was just what we'd call a lie. Uh, and uh, oh, the, the government was taking climate change seriously. And look at all the money we're spending tackling climate change. They they were just shoveling money on to their friends in both instances. But you know, they they just came up with a story that kind of justified giving money to their friends, but they were dressing up their self-interest as national interest. Absolutely, yeah. Nicolette. I have to say that the EVs are going to end the weekend was a great <laughs> one. Ah, corker. Yes. Yep. Um, and probably, travelled well. It did. And probably the one that just made my jaw really drop was um, Scott Morrison's lying about why he didn't tell his Cabinet colleagues about appointing himself as the Minister for Everything. There's one thing lying to us, the public, but to lie to your own tribe, I just find that extraordinary. So moving on very quickly from from Scott Morrison, we um, might talk about um, the upcoming election. There could be an election called as early as August this year. Um, so we really, it's really important for communities to get mobilised and get connected and network together. Um, if you know, for example, we saw advance, advance and descend on Dunkley during that by election, a community that uh, presumably had no strong established networks of, of defence, like a lot of the communities in the community independence movement where people are well networked and and have that sort of radical trust and that those networks of trust how can communities you know is that a sign of things to come and and how can communities prepare for that level of saturation richard oh well i think as you said get organized early i mean it could be an election from august my guess is it'll be next year but the prime minister hasn't taken me into his confidence on that. Uh, <laughs> although he, he did, he did sort of rule out an early election, but that's that's meaningless. Uh, that might be a lie or, or misinformation. <laughs> right. um, so I guess the thing that I always advise people when they're thinking about campaigns is that uh, at some point you're going to have to organise the logistics. So the earlier you do that stuff you know, the the more time you'll have at the end to do all of the sort of more reactive stuff. So, it, it, you know, there's a whole bunch of logistics in organising a campaign. If you're 
uh, you know, you're going to need a lot of people to hand out uh, how to vote cards on the day. You need to know how many booths there are. You need to know how many entrances there are to each booth. You need to figure out how many hours you think someone will stand on a booth. God, I know that sounds boring, but my point is <laughs> if you actually think about the actual logistics of the day way early, then it means in the two months, the one month, the week leading up to election day, you can actually be doing the engaging with the community stuff uh, that that at that stage people really will want to engage with you on. So, yeah, early preparation is a key. And to be clear, it's a real asset that the existing parties have, right, because it's a repeat game for them. So they remember from last time what they did. They know what worked. They know what didn't. So it is harder for new entrants uh, to, to get organised in this way because, even if uh, even if there's a new campaign manager for a seat in a, for a major party, they're not starting from scratch. So yeah. log- logistics. Good advice. Thank you, Nicolette. Um, you have just gone through the process that Richard um, Richard has uh, sort of mapped out for everybody in the 2022 election, and also. Um, Advance also played a role in a lot of disinformation in the no campaign during the referendum and your community, um, you know, has an interesting story to tell, a unique story. And how did you, your community, control the narrative and achieve a yes yes vote under those circumstances? Yeah. Um, Probably just want to call out too, we were the only uh, seat that was uh, represented by a Liberal in the entire country that succeeded with the yes majority. Bittersweet outcome, I must say. And also, too, I want to talk about we. It's Bradfield for yes. It's not just Nicolette Buller's campaign for it being an independent. It's um, we had every colour of the political spectrum and those who've never done anything campaigning in their lives before walk yeah. into our campaign office to get themselves a Yes 23 T-shirt and, and to, to join up. So, yeah, how did we inoculate the community against lies in the referendum? But to be honest, we fell into a bit of a trap to start with. We thought... We were going to learn about all the facts. So we bought lots of copies of Mayo and O'Brien's um, book and uh, I read it three or four times. I even slept with it under my pillow for a week, hoping it would go in my head better. And every time there was a new bit of disinformation that emerged, we just swaddled it with facts and we did our Q&A and distributed it everywhere. But it was only after about two or three weeks that we realised that we felt better if we knew the facts, but we were not connecting with people as well as we could have. Um, so we need to, I suppose it's, it's been said before, create new and, but really build on our established networks of trust. So it's easier to connect with people when you have shared values and you have stories to tell. So in any possible opportunity, uh, door knocking or having a conversation at the train station, I'd ask, Hey, would you like to know why I'm thinking about voting? Yes. And that is a very different way of connecting with people. And then you can lay on some uh, some facts if you like. But we had volunteers who started just literally a few weeks after the dust settled from the election campaign in 2022 uh-huh. with kitchen table conversations. Um, then we had we went to every organisation that launched a you know um, how to how to win this. We, we went to all of those things. But at the end of the day, we went very hard five months. At the end of our recruitment, on the day, we had 470 volunteers who had run 128 events. We gave out flyers, at had conversations at train stations, as I mentioned, wearing those Yes T-shirts at at cafes. We hosted a town hall. We sent out 60 emails, and we knocked on nearly 3,000 doors. Um, And in my opinion, opinion, I think that's why we cut through. Uh, It was a face-to-face meeting people where they live, where they work, where they recreate, and engaging with them as members, fellow members of the community alongside values. Um, Did we use the social media? Yes, we tried. But because we are yes campers, we're just not seeing all the noise that's being pushed out to the soft and hard no voters, which Mm -hmm. Vance and the LNP were pushing to. We get the bots that come onto our feeds and try to take us on and we got really quite clever at obviously seeing those they've got all the numbers behind their names you know john wyatt seven five zero zero exclamation mark but Mm -hmm. the main thing was not to respond not to put that algorithm and push it up so it's a bit questionable about how much effort you want to put into your organic socials 
But certainly, I think the superpower of the secret source is these trust networks leaning in early, as Richard said, and building them out over time. Um, and, and just to be, I mean, just to really show, I know Warren Mundine, who ran the No campaign, he um, is a constituent in Bradfield. And um, oh. Paul Fletcher, the member for Bradfield, is the um, manager of opposition business. If anyone is in the job of pushing out opposition cabinet policy, it's Mr. Fletcher. And these two gentlemen were in the electorate time and time again. They had an event at the Greengate Hotel, for example, but we still managed to pull off a majority. Yes, those tactics just were happening because they weren't going out to the shopping centres and meeting people where they are. So um, I suppose the message is Sky News, uh, Sky at Night is um, is going to exist. I still get letters under the office door telling me all sorts of horrible things. Um, you cannot inoculate the entire electorate against that. Information, that entertainment gets more hits than information. And um, if you click on these things, it's part of the business model. Um, YouTube from the Murdoch Press pays the organization money when you click on that. They get more money from their YouTube channel than they do from their subscription to Sky. So uh, I just say don't get discouraged. Start early. You can't convert everybody, but if you're putting up a community independent, you really only need to get 50 plus 1%. Very good advice. Thank you so much to go out there. And Richard, I I also noticed that the Australia Institute um, did some polling and some research after the referendum that I've got a couple of stats here and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that showed that more than 60% of no voters were concerned about the disinformation and misinformation that was circulated on social media during the referendum and uh, more than 80% of that cohort wants to see truth in political advertising laws before the next election, which is interesting. Absolutely. Yeah, so think of it this way. Uh, The no campaign thinks the yes campaign lied. Uh, The yes campaign thinks the no campaign lied. The beautiful thing, and this is where democracy actually works, is that everybody thinks that other people lied Therefore, the good news is everybody agrees that we need some form of truth in political advertising. Now, this kind of messes with some people's heads. They're like, but I don't want to agree with those no people. Like those no people, they're not sincere. It's like, shut up and listen. They're agreeing with you about a principle. Do you want to argue with them about why they formed their view or do you want to take their support to the bank? So, yeah, it doesn't surprise me at all that there's really strong support in Australia for uh, for laws to prevent um, people just flat out lying in political campaigns. And it's really important to see that and see that, look, actually fellow citizens who might even disagree with you about what a lie is <laughs> can agree with you about what a solution looks like. And, and nothing enrages the kind of right-wing campaign is more than you sounding reasonable. And agreeing okay. with them. <laughs> they, yeah, because they want everything to be a culture war. They do. Yeah. And, 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 yeah, we have to fight some of those fights. But when there's an opportunity to go up a level, when there's an opportunity to say, well, even if we disagree on that, surely we can agree on this, nothing makes them sadder than you sounding reasonable. <laughs> no, this is really important. This is the opposite of Twitter. This is how humans feel. Yep. So, you know, imagine you're sitting at a dinner table and there's, you know, eight people and one of them's an obnoxious bore. Do you spend all night debating the obnoxious bore or do you find a way to take the conversation up a level in a way that trivializes that person? And I hate to tell you, but that's what political strategy is. That's what democracy requires. And they want to drag us down into the mud debating stupid, crazy nonsense, whereas actually if we resist that temptation to be performatively right at them, if we resist the urge to know more facts and to be smarter and to be righter, if we resist that urge and go, well, I don't know about that, but what I do know is everyone here in the room supports X, all of a sudden the person who's literally just there to cause trouble is made to feel small and irrelevant, not an accident, 
while you get to engage with most people in the room. So if you stick with that kind of kitchen table sense of organising, actually think, how would I engage with the moron at that table? How do I engage (laughs) with the drunk uncle at that table? And it is not head-on conflict. Absolutely. And I'm glad you brought that. I was actually going to say to Nicolette, you mentioned the kitchen tables, both of you have. Um, it's a it's a, a model that um, is used a lot in the community independence uh, movement. Um, for anyone on the call tonight that ha- doesn't know what a KTC or a kitchen table conversation is, I think maybe Nicolette, you could elaborate a bit on that and tell us about how though that respect, that um, forum for a respectful conversation can be carried out into the other activities that you talked about in community as well and make it easier to have those, you know, usually confrontational kind of conversations that Richard was talking about in and bring it down a level and in a respectful way we can often find consensus on on certain things. Yeah, that's right. And I, I, I echo everything Richard said. The, um, the, you know, one of the big things that's playing out at the moment is the Liberal National Party's nuclear debate, right? And suddenly it's... um. It's getting traction. We had the anti-renewables rally um, and we had all the, I suppose, the socials with wind turbines cutting up endearing minky whales and and we've had Ted O'Brien, the, the Shadow Minister for uh, Energy and Climate Change on 7.30, talking about the pace and scale, um, the, the, yeah, the pace and cost of, of nuclear energy as a solution for Australia. And just to lean in with, Really, I suppose this is a precisely a kitchen table conversation on this one around tackling this issue is um, really a, how I would do it is like no one really wants to be taken as a as a fool. So, and a lot of this mis- and disinformation is actually making victims, uh, you know, Australians victims out of this misinformation. So leading with people are taking, being taken for a ride um, with misinformation being spread about nuclear energy in Australia. Um, where it's up to, we have to ask ourselves, whose interests does it serve to spread these lies, right? Um, I bet your bottom dollar, it's not yours or mine. Then you want to find that the truth part, which is what I see as being true, um, is that we're facing a climate crisis and everything should be on the table. I think that's Richard's point where you agree and de-escalate, make a common place for everybody, and then you pivot. So unfortunately, we can't afford to wait for the year of nuclear energy uh, to arrive in Australia. We can't wait for it to get financed and, and built. The climate crisis is now. So the positive message then is the good news is that we've got today technologies ready to deploy at scale in solar, wind and batteries. So the um, the kitchen table conversation allows you to engage people in a respectful place because they're usually people that you've invited or your friends know or the neighbours. So they're only a few steps away and you get to practice these conversations where you find common ground, pivot, and and get your your message out, and then it builds from there. It's fantastic. Then they'll hold a kitchen table conversation, and on and on and on goes the the wonderful thread of trust building communities. Fantastic! So good, so good, and and I think that's that's so important to have those conversations for civic education and, and all sorts of things. So, for example, um, independent for Ringas, Ali Stegall has uh, been pushing her. Um, ending truth, um, ending lies in political advertising bill. Uh, <laughs> excuse me. And um, Richard, do you want to tell us a bit more about where that stands? Uh, well, I guess I mean, so private members bills uh, are a really important way to put issues on the on the agenda and to show people, uh, you know, what what laws a parliament could make. Um, when there's a when there's a governing party with a majority, it's hard to get uh, debate, let alone votes, on these things. But Regardless, um, the, the the Albanese government and indeed even Peter Dutton has recently made some positive noises about the need for truth in political advertising laws. Um, and look, we do lots of research at the Australian Institute. And again, I mean, what I said before, trying to de-escalate things is not an accident. It's kind of how humans work well together. So one of the easiest ways to kind of not so much win an argument, but to persuade people you're not crazy is to say, look, it already exists, which is obviously the least radical, least sexy, yeah. least exciting way to make a case for something because it's the opposite of I'm so smart I've thought of something that no one's ever thought of. But frankly, no one trusts you if you think you're that smart. They actually would trust you more if you said, you know, South Australia's already got truth in political advertising laws. 
And you know, when the Liberals were in power, they didn't bother to try and remove them because they worked just fine. And you know that a- the ACT's had them for quite some time. And again, this is not un- you know this is uncontroversial. And you know, other countries exist, right? And they've got them too. So <laughs> look at that. There's no reason that we can't have them in federal parliament and all of a sudden your big, exciting new idea isn't big and it's not exciting and it's not new. It's just an idea that's already been tested, that already works, and, hey, most people think it's a good idea. So part of de-escalating is not making yourself the smart person. I know it feels – I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about the person (laughs) sitting next to you, right? Other people want to be smart. And it's just not persuasive to be smart. You want to engage with humans in ways that make them feel comfortable and safe. So, look, where's it up to? Oh, it's a very live issue. I mean, you know, the Australian Institute pushed really hard on the government. Um, I personally did before the the referendum and said, look, now is the time to do this. You know this campaign is going to be Mm. full of lies. Uh, And they didn't. And and it it hurt a lot of people and it, it certainly hurt the end result. So I think Labor can see that there's benefits in doing it. And frankly, I think the Liberals don't really want to be on the on the defence on this issue. Like I think that the Liberals have seen our polling, they've seen other people's polling. They don't really want to go to the election saying, we don't need any laws to stop us from lying. <laughs> and we don't want the other politicians to have you know, like it's it's Let's when you but when you pitch it like that, it's not yeah. even a good it's not even a good issue for the coalition to be the only people demanding the right to lie. Absolutely. But it wouldn't surprise me if they continued on that <laughs> trajectory. Nor I. Let, let's watch and see with that one. But um, now, Richard, you say that tax reform, for example, is about democracy and not mm. economics. Um, and that the biggest lie of all is that we can't change anything and we can't afford to fix all the big problems of our time. Um, what role can community play in changing this narrative? So it's <laughs> really important. Oh, thank you. And and who doesn't want to talk about tax reform at 7.30 on a Wednesday <laughs> night, a uh, Tuesday night? I don't even know what day it is. Um, yeah. Look, look here, let, so let me start somewhere slightly differently, but I thank you for the question. Um, Australia is one of the richest countries in the world. We're living at the richest point in world history. Uh, we're so rich that when, uh, when, when our former treasurer, Josh Frydenberg, was asked, can we afford $370 billion for some nuclear subs? His reply was, yes, if it's a priority, you can always afford it. All right, so that's how rich we are. <laughs> hey, you got a lazy 370 bill for some new nuclear subs we didn't know we needed? Sure. Like, how good is it to live in a country that rich? We just passed $300 billion worth of stage three tax cuts and no one said we couldn't afford them. And both parties supported the old version and the new version. The sticker price was the same. The distribution was different. Mm -hmm. So there's half a trillion bucks with two policies. But you want to spend some more money helping women fleeing domestic violence. Oh, geez, that's a bit expensive. Are you are you sure? Are you sure? You want to you want to you want to tackle climate change and not sink the the islands in the Torres Strait or the Tiwi Islands. Oh, that's where's the money going to come from? So we've been trained, <laughs> like we've been trained to feel poor, and we've been trained to think that conversations about tax are boring, and that budgets are boring, and that economists should do budgety things, and mm-hmm. other people should do democracy things. Well, I tell you what, the budget is. It's the only honest bit of democracy. It is literally the list of who pays and who gets. So if you think budgets are boring, you just dealt yourself out of democracy because every year the Commonwealth budget says who gets the $700 billion we're going to spend. There is nothing less boring than who gets the $700 billion. But we've kind of been trained, oh, tax reform, nah, that's, 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 that's a them issue, whereas the reality is, you know, my one-liner on this is we're a rich country, we can afford to do anything we want, but we can't afford to do everything we want. And all the budget does is spell out what our priorities are. So if we want to be one of the lowest tax countries in the developed world, and we are, if we want to be one of the lowest tax countries in the developed world, we won't have anything like the health and education and childcare and aged care systems they have in Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Finland, these countries do exist. 
So <laughs> if we want to have different a different society, if we want to have a different environment, if we want to have a different culture, we can. But we would actually have to make a whole bunch of different tax and spending decisions. And there's no right answer. Like Singapore and Sweden look radically different. The United States and Germany look radically different. Their budgets look radically different because their societies are radically different. So, yeah, for me, talking about what do you, you know, where do we want to collect? Well, do we want to collect more tax or less? Right? I'm happy to collect more. I'm happy to pay more. I didn't need the stage three tax cuts. And I'd be very happy if the gas industry paid a hell of a lot more tax. I'd be very happy if Google and Facebook paid us a hell of a lot more tax. And you know what? If we made Google, Facebook, and the gas industry pay a hell of a lot of tax, you could even be populist and you could all have a tax cut and we'd still all have more money. See how much fun tax reform is? <laughs> so like, much fun. <laughs> right. Because it's literally who pays and who gets. And there's nothing more democratic than that conversation. So it's no accident that my former students are employed to make it seem technocratic and make it seem hard and make it seem boring so that we can sit around and divvy up who gets the $700 billion while you sit around just wondering why we can't afford to have nice things. Absolutely. Have you seen any difference? What have you seen in the independence movement um, over the past sort of, you know, in this past election cycle where, you know, alternative candidates and more strategic voting and, and you know, the way that Crossbench have been, been behaving, have we seen any any difference and any improvement to that democratic process? Absolutely. I mean, a lot of people were really struck that a lot of the independents who won at the last election, who won relatively high income former liberal seats, a lot of people were really struck to see them supporting changes to the stage three tax cuts on the basis that, you know, the stage three tax cuts delivered far too much money to high income earners. A lot of people were really surprised. Hang on, but you represent a rich electorate. Well, you know what? Even in a rich electorate, most, most voters aren't rich. <laughs> right, even in the highest income electorates uh, like uh, like Wentworth, um, most people earn nothing like one hundred and eighty thousand bucks. So, so the idea in our heads been, oh, that's a liberal seat. It's full of rich people. The local member of parliament should should always love tax cuts for the highest income earners. Well, I think all the independents figured out pretty fast. Well, actually. Most people in their in the, in the high income electorates earn a lot less than that. The other thing that I think is good politics and very good policy is that a lot of the independents have focused on the absurdity that Australia spends eleven billion dollars a year on fossil fuel subsidies, um, particularly new subsidies to open new coal mines or new gas projects. Because I promise you, uh, a lot of conservative voters don't like subsidies. Full stop. So you know, actually, it's a conservative thing to say, mm. I don't know why government's wasting money on that. Absolutely. A lot of voters don't like climate change, so they like hearing that. And guess what? Not a lot of coal and gas exploration in most inner city seats. So even if you were worried about jobs, which I think is an exaggerated thing, uh, then there's just the politics and the policy of, of independence talking about getting rid of fossil fuel subsidies. Yeah, it's a wonderful thing, and, and Labor hates it. It's one of the reasons Labor's so keen to fight with the Liberals about nuclear is they don't want to fight with independence about fossil fuel subsidies. Absolutely. And and also very keen to bring in donation reform, but we won't go into that one tonight because <laughs> we'll be here all night. And as much as I think everybody in the audience probably would love to hear your predictions for the budget, having brought that up as well, we're going to have to save that for, they'll have to go, come to one of your other events to hear about budget in the next couple of months because uh, we've got a lot to go out tonight. But I'm glad you raised, uh, you know, the issue of climate um, action and, and fossil fuels and taxation because Nicolette, you have been working for decades in the climate space and watch, you know, you've witnessed it to being undermined uh, by the spread of myths and disinformation and uh, misinformation, who benefits um, and what role can communities and independents play in the intersection between integrity and climate? Oh, all right. Um, (laughs) I always like to start and go, yes, when I hear bits of information, exactly that, what's the source? Who's paying for it? Who does this benefit? And unfortunately, just even listening to Richard's Peace just then, it, it is special interest every single time. The one thing that gives me some hope is, is the last 35 years, we've seen a systematic decrease in the primary vote to the major parties. And 
we are increasingly seeing elections played on issues rather than loyalty to brands that, you know, come with those incumbent parties. So um, the, the, you know, Climate. I'm, I'm a little bit of a bit of PTSD, and you to be honest, uh, probably yeah. just going to call out probably okay. one of the the things that I hear time and time again is this concept of the the climate debate, and that is just permeate. That's the very word debate suggests there is no consensus. There is nothing solid on which we can make policy, and it's the reason that we haven't had, you know, really good ambitious clean energy policy that unlocks all that private capital that's sitting in super funds to retool our economy and make it competitive. It's the reason that we, you know, we've got a offshore oil piece of legislation in the house at the moment. Um, it is just very frustrating that we continue to peddle language, which undermines public policy getting done well. So that's my bare bung on that one. To how do you again? How do you inoculate? How do you make this this stuff work? I think it comes down to those key parts. You can go on social media and try and give it a go. Please don't click on stuff that is nasty. Go and write an email out to yourself and don't put it to anybody. Read it a few times and then delete it. But please don't go on social media and push that algorithm up or share stuff because that's exactly how the mis and disinformation gets out. Um, I'll just hammer it home. Don't vilify people. Um, Richard's already pointed that out. Agreeing with people is a fantastic way of de-escalating and start early and have these face-to-face conversations in safe places with people that already, with whom you already have some shared connections. There could be people, your kids might play in the local football club together. You'll find, you'll build, find that commonality, build on that and grow the trust through conversations and that it sounds really simple and it is but it takes a lot of time Mm -hmm. and it doesn't happen overnight so if you're going to run an independent candidate get started early you don't need your candidate just now but you can start having those kitchen table conversations and listening to people about the issues that matter to them I, I noticed in the questions there was somebody asking when they'd be interesting in a KTC to have um, a kitchen table conversation instead of asking someone about what the issues are, ask them on which issue they would like to spend the most in a federal budget. That's a great one to see what comes out. (laughs) See? (laughs) Democracy. (laughs) Democracy in action. (laughs) But this is, and and that's, in my opinion as well, I think that's why we're here. It's why I put my hand up to run is uh, I also believe, it's tempting to believe that for decades the major, it suited the major parties to be divisive and to make, politics a toxic yucky thing that no one wants to look at because just leave us to get on with doing our making our decisions that meet ourselves self special interest groups fossil fuel all over the place right um and and it's just that's enough really let's get on with the job everybody thanks for being part of this community get started early and start having those conversations and you know as i said keep weaving that lovely thread of trust between people because that's the way and it's the they can't get here. They they just can't beat us at that. That is our superpower and we need to play to that strength. Absolutely. Richard, did you want to add something to that? No, I, I, I agree. I absolutely agree. And the other thing is it's just always cheaper to tell the truth. Like all these astroturfing costs a lot of money. All the lies cost a lot of money. Buying and paying for bots to distribute bullshit costs a lot of money so much cheaper to tell the truth so kind of don't be over don't be overwhelmed by oh there's billionaires and they're gonna beat us uh yeah no nah. it's just not true they might but not if we actually do all the things that nicolette just described get involved and stay involved and nicolette you also talked about the role of language um in certainly in the climate wars um but um Let's talk about now, I'm sure everybody listening is interested to talk about the role of the media plays in amplifying lies under the guise of balance, um, thereby sort of like legitimising players and reinforcing old dichotomies. Um, Can you share some examples um, and talk about the role that journalism has been playing in disinformation? I'm going to go first on that, Richard. 
just at the high level. And, and it's, I'm, it's, it's kind of my lane here, but I've seen it in climate all the time. The, the, you know, the ABC in particular, obviously, and somewhat I understand because they're always under constant pressure to appear balanced. But there's a point where something is sufficiently scientifically factual. I know that's not a word you want to use in science or the theory has, you know, hasn't been disproved yet. Um, climate is the case. And we, it, but we still heard equal airtime to crappy stuff that was wrong and served very special interests compared to what was a scientific consensus. I think it's fantastic that we've seen the CSIRO recently step up and say, oi, let's not Let's not take down and vilify, vilify our scientists. That is an incredibly important part of it. all of the trust that moves between us as players in this democracy, and we need to get behind and in the and and back those scientists up as well, not just on climate but in all sorts of areas as well. And we saw that with um, with COVID and the pandemic and the management of that, and we saw the media do this balance thing again when we had the referendum. Somehow, somehow it took, it, there, I don't know, I, I don't know why, but there was, when we analysed the yes and no pamphlet, the yes pamphlet had fewer misinformation incidences than the no pamphlet, but somehow it, the no, the no got just as much airtime with their misinformation and disinformation than the yes did. And I just think in that respect, the media was complicit, frankly, in the outcome of that referendum that we had at the end of last year. So um, the very next chapter is this, um, the nuclear debate. Um, oh, I just used the word debate. I fell for it. Fell into the trap. But it's, it's, it's not, we don't need a balanced view on this. It's, we don't have an industry here. We've got no people that work in. We've got a few people that do some medical isotopes out at Lucas Heights in New South Wales and we've just closed another facility down. We don't. We cannot get this up fast enough to help be part of the energy mix to address the climate crisis here in Australia. It just doesn't add up anywhere. And yet you watch the media, particularly obviously Murdoch media, but even other media like the ABC give this the airtime that it does. Now, hats off to Sarah Ferguson. She was outstanding on 7.30 when she took on Ted O'Brien, um, but not everyone has the tenacity that she does and the skills. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, yeah. yeah, watch it here. Which, you know, I think should be in the bar as a journalist, you know, but Richard, the media? Oh, uh, yeah, look, I'm, I mean, I would just start, I agree again with Nicolette, but I'd just start somewhere different. The lived in power for 10 years. They didn't try to build any nuclear power stations. They're taking the piss. It's a distraction. Like, <laughs> you know, like everything else is a fourth order thing. When they were in power... They didn't even try, you know. So, you know, I think you always kind of have to, unfortunately, before you get into the facts, you know, you actually have to start with what's going on here? Why are we having this conversation? Who started it? You know, so, so yeah. And, look, I just drew a little thing while Nicolette was talking. Oh, you so were getting look, creative there. I, I am <laughs> the world's worst drawer. All right, so let's, <laughs> okay. let's try this. Is that, can you read that? Is that going to yep, work? Left, centre, or, yeah. We can see left, centre, right? Yeah, right. So cent- that's how centres see themselves, right? I just want to be in the centre, right? I just, I define myself from the binaries. There's a left and a right and I'm in the centre. And that's what the ABC is trying to do. Um, so much wrong with that, including like, you know, we don't really debate the science of gravity too often and we don't usually put, you know. Are there two sides to that one, Richard? Oh, well, there's well, no, that's the other thing. Like, like, apart from the idea that there's always a debate, there's there's probably more than two sides. Like you can't define a centre, and it's it's actually. It, and I'm writing a, a thing about this at the moment in terms of you know Anthony Green and how confused he gets on election night. Yes, like, we we have this whole mental model that there is only two sides, you know, and it's Labor or Liberal, and 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 and. You know, I'm an economist. I promise you, there are more than two competing views in economics. Like there's about a million, right? But but when it gets debated in the media, there's a left wing view and a right wing view, and then maybe someone saying, "Oh, I'll have a bit of both of them in the centre." So yeah. so on the one hand, we think that there's a debate about everything. That's wrong. 
On the other hand, we think there's two sides to everything. No, there might be a hundred. Right. So yeah, I'm sorry that my little left yeah. right and it doesn't work. But but here's the punchline. Uh, oh, oh it forward, no, backwards, we can't see it. Oh. Hang on. Oh, I, oh there oh, we go. go. Wrap it on your head. Advantage. Wrap <laughs> <laughs> it on your head. Oh. Right. So the center is actually being centrist is often just an excuse for being on the side of power while while you're actually doing nothing to help people who are in dire straits, right? So Kiribati is sinking right now. Kiribati is sinking. The IPCC says the entire nation will be gone by 2060. There's no left or right about this, right? That's what the science says. So when I say things like, why are we still building new fossil fuel projects when the science says if we do that, there is no chance of stopping Kiribati from sinking. And indeed, we're probably assigning a, a wide range of other countries the same fate. Is that I don't get how that's left or right. Right? That's that's just what's going on. But if I was on the ABC and said, you realize that if we keep building new coal and gas projects, that entire nation states are going to vanish and that will be largely Australia's responsibility because it doesn't matter where in the world our coal gets burnt, it causes the climate change. There's no left or right here. That's just what's happening. So, yeah, so unfortunately the idea of the media wanting to be centrist sends them off looking for bizarre views simply so that they don't say simple things too simply. Absolutely. And and when we were sort of talking about this Zoom, uh, you sort of said that you feel like I think the Anthony Green thing as well, that we we need a new language for independent seats as well. My prediction with uh, my concern with the media in the next election is that in the seats that are currently um, held by community independents, the lazy media and journalists will refer to those seats as safe liberal seats rather than independent seats. And that will just sort of reinforce these old power structures and these old dichotomies and, and really put us at a dis- disadvantage if the uh, if journalism you know, if the media can't just step up um, to to the current reality. Yeah, oh, absolutely. So I, I said before, yeah, I think Anthony Green just, you know, is in a flat all election <laughs> night these days. He just literally can't cope. Oh, the computer's <laughs> distributing the two-party preferred wrong. It's like, yeah, that's because literally the spreadsheet you made is shit, mate. Right? <laughs> it's because it's because your starting point is you know two-party who's preferred. It's two-party preferred. Like put an if in your spreadsheet. It's not that complicated. So step one, there's that language issue. There's the language issue of hung parliament. It's, no, it's just a parliament. Um, I'll come back to that if you want. There's nothing special about a minority government. You know, we have we you know, governments almost never have a majority in the upper house. They always have to debate and persuade independence. But then to the point that you raise then, and you know, yeah, like. So the Australian Institute, we're working on a paper at the moment about new language for this stuff because Absolutely. this sounds sounds a bit grandiose, but with this new paradigm that we're in, the, the language, the categories that we've been using just don't hold. So if Sophie Scomps can win McKellar on a 15% margin, there's no such thing in Australia as a safe seat. No, it's just it's not Absolutely. a thing. There's yep. no such thing. What there are... But there might be seats that are safe against Labor ever winning and there might be seats that are safe against the Liberals ever winning. Mm -hmm. But there's literally no seat in Australia that is safe against the right independent putting their hand up and saying, you know, you're both a bit crap. Now, that's not going to happen in every electorate. I'm not predicting that every electorate will elect independents, but statistically, and sophologically, never said that out loud before. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, well. just, it's just not a meaningful thing to have this category of safe seat yep. versus marginal seat when the reality is that what, what safe means is that Labor thinks the Libs can't beat them or the Libs think Labor can't beat them. And as Nicolette showed in a very, very, very safe seat of Bradfield, it's not safe anymore. But you know what? It's still safe against Labor winning, right? So the the whole language has evolved. The McKellar, uh, the McKellar, Malcolm McKerris pendulum, right? All of that stuff is just built into it. Is two party preferred, two party preferred. With Anthony getting a little bit sad, you know, when the independents and the and the minor parties are, are making his 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 graphics look messy. 
Well, um, can I just throw in sorry, just yeah. about the, the minor party piece too, or the hung parliament in particular? And um, let's yeah. not forget that the Liberal National Party is a coalition of two parties, mm-hmm. and we only saw that today with um, the well, actually, the Greens putting forward its um, its bill to deal with the powers of the uh, the major supermarkets, the Nationals wanting to lean in and back that, and the Liberals coming in their coalition of their of their I can't call it a hung parliament because they don't currently have government, um, but you know yep. putting a lot of cold water on that and saying that's a no go. So it, that is you know that they haven't ruled by themselves the Liberals or the Nationals for ever. a long time, a long very time. long time. And I'm coming to you for tonight from Ngunnawal country, also known as the People's Republic of the ACT, where we've lived under the tyranny of <laughs> minority possible. government since 2008. It's it's hell here, I tell you. People. <laughs> I don't know how. <laughs> now, this has been a fantastic discussion, but I'm very conscious that um, we're coming uh, towards the end of our time together and there have been a few questions from the audience. So one of the questions uh, was for Richard, is there likely to be a media royal commission as has been petitioned for? No, I don't think that it's likely at all. Um, uh, I think it would be a good thing, but I think that this government has shown absolutely no appetite for that. Uh, and I don't think they want to pick a fight with the Murdoch press in the lead up to the election. Um, but I think we need to, uh, whether it's through royal commissions or other means, I think we really need to look at uh, the role of and the responsibilities of the media uh, in 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 the era we find ourselves in. Because in some sense, like a lot of people, hark back to the good old days of. You know, when Kerry Packer owned Channel 9 and democracy ran smoothly, I don't think that the good old days were that good, but we live in interesting times and we couldn't have come together like this 20 years ago. This is great. Yeah. This is not a threat to democracy at all, uh, but but some things are. So I think we need uh, a, a good hard look at, not just in Australia but around the world, uh, media reform and you know, the media bargaining code was far from perfect, but that was introduced by the coalition, supported by Labor and the Greens, and it enraged Facebook and it enraged Google because uh, it worked. Our parliament actually came together and created world-first legislation that made those social media giants, see, I'm talking about tax reform again, I snuck it in, uh, <laughs> pay, pay some money. I'll take you anyway, Richard. <laughs> so, you know, my point is I don't think we'll have a Royal Commission, uh, but regardless, I think we need to keep the pressure on for media reform and media regulation. We need to fix the ABC. Stop saying save it. It is not in good shape. I don't want to save it the way it is. And yeah. when lefties or progressives or independents or anyone that's not the Labor and Liberal Party say we need to save the ABC, it just winds the right up and say, see, the ABC is this left-wing thing. No, it's not. It's just a hollow shell of its former self. I don't want to save it. I want to fix it. Absolutely. Another great example of how language can be so powerful. Let's change that language. Everybody on the call, um, if you see people saying that expression, you know, <laughs> get in there on social media and say, nope, we want to fix it. Let's start that that trend. Um, there's another question from the audience. Um, are we winning the war against the gutter media in advance? Someone, oh, they ask about Dunkley. Labor increased its vote. Does that mean that disinformation didn't land? I, I wasn't on the ground in Dunkley, but I almost certainly that disinformation landed. Yes, it would have. Um, I, I the, yes is probably the answer, but um, I, I don't know. I'm passing over here. Watch this pass, whole pass over to Richard. <laughs> and the ball over to Richard. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it 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 certainly worked. It had some impact, but it significantly didn't have the desired impact. Um, and it, it, it highlights the limitations of the advanced model as well as its strengths. Um, and here are the limitations. The uh, advanced run a campaign to say put Labor last at a by-election where Pauline Hanson didn't run, One Nation didn't run, the Liberal Democrats didn't run. What would advance do in a general election when there's lots of right-wing parties running? Will they say vote one Liberal or will they say vote one Palmer or will they say vote one... No, they're not actually divide. They're not actually united. They don't know, mm. right? So, uh, so on the one hand, you know, yeah, I think they 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 muddied the waters. They they caused some harm. They shifted some boats. But 
flip that on its head. If 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 a good independent candidate, ideally for that seat, uh, a woman had run and we'd spent four hundred grand on her, uh, I think the Liberal primary vote would have collapsed. So, you know, I I, I think that the Dunkley by election was a terrible night for advance and a terrible night for conservatives. They spent a lot of money. They achieved nothing. And that was in the middle of a cost of living crisis Absolutely. In, a, in, in election where there was where they were actually united around, you know, who the enemy was and whose side they were on. That won't happen at the general election. Yeah, yeah. And I think the other key point about by-elections for community independent campaigns is that um, quite often we hear from people at the CIP, you know, asking if there's anything happening in Cook or, you know, in Dunkley at the last by-election. Um, it's very hard to mobilise a, a, a community independent campaign. It's not impossible to mobilise that in a very short period of time for the reasons that we've been talking about tonight, which is that now is the time, you know, it's really important to put that time in well ahead of elections to build those communities, to have those important conversations and the difficult conversations in your community um, and start early. It's the only way to, to start to debunk and pre-bunk and, and do the civic education piece that is really important in, in all of these electorates um, and that inoculation. Um, Another example that we talked about for anyone on the call who would like to know more about some of the um, the inoculation tactics and things that you can do um, to cope with uh, disinformation ahead of the next election, we did a Zoom last year with Zali and um, Ed Coper and talked about his uh, wonderful book, Facts and Other Lies. So have a look on the CIP website and you can watch that video where we talk in detail about debunking and pre-bunking and also fact sandwiches, which I think Nicolette might have mentioned tonight as well. Um, and so you're welcome to look at that anytime. Uh, I think we're running out of time. So I'd like to thank both of you, Nicolette and Richard, for taking the time to join us tonight and for putting, Nicolette, all the time you're putting in to, to your campaign um, and your community, especially during the referendum. And Richard, for everything that the Australia Institute does, we absolutely love you. Um, so thank you for spending this time with us tonight. It's been really interesting. Thanks so much. And thanks, everyone, for being involved. Democracy thrives on high expectations. Yeah, and I'd back in. Absolutely. Do, we need a, do we need a Royal Commission? No. Uh, this Community Independent Project, this, this group that we're involved in, is exactly the antidote to the crappy media situation. Get out, have those conversations and build those trust networks. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I was going to say the same thing, Nicolette. So thank you very much. Now is the time to start building those networks of trust in your electorate and give people established community independent candidate to vote for out there. Um, don't forget to, to check out the recording um, with Ed and Zali and, and all of the other recordings on our website. There's lots of practical tools on, on many aspects of uh, running a campaign or building a community movement. Uh, there's a KTC guide and many other things. Um, save the date for our convention, which is on Saturday the 22nd of June. Uh, we'll also be hosting a networking event the night before, so we look forward to seeing your faces the night before. Um, We'll email the registration details for our convention soon, so keep an eye on your inboxes for that. Um, have a wonderful evening. Thank you for all of the volunteer hours that you all put in to, to make our democracy better, and uh, thank you for joining us, and have a wonderful evening. Thanks, Anjo. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Nicolette. Thank you.